Grace, peace, and mercy and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Based on Psalm 3, actually we're going to be looking through Psalm 3 throughout the sermon. If you have a Bible, I'd encourage you to open today. We rarely hear sermons based on the Psalms, and as I looked through the Epistle and the Gospel and the Old Testament reading, I found myself drawn to the Psalm because it has a message that we rarely hear and a message that I think is important for us to, to learn and to be comforted with. If your Bible includes the written on occasion when uh, David had to flee before his son Absalom who had uh, the psalm begins O Lord how many are my foes many are rising against me of my soul there is no salvation for him in God just a little background to this section here. Uh, perhaps you remember Absalom and his treachery. It goes back to Absalom's sister, Tamar. Tamar uh, was uh, desired by one of Absalom's brothers, uh, or one of Tamar's, yeah, Absalom's brothers. Uh, he, he wanted Tamar, and so he schemed to assault committed a sexual assault against her, and um, Absalom plotted to get back with him, and uh, in that two-year period, he killed his, his brother, Amon, for the crime. And then he for fear of David, and uh, King David, after a period of time, allowed him back into the country, but he couldn't come back to the palace, so he lived away from the king for two more years. And he called for the advisors to ask David to... The advisors wouldn't allow him back into the palace. So, uh, or, or the advisors wouldn't come to visit him. And so what uh, Absalom did is he set one of their fields on fire, figuring they're going to come and take care of their field. And when they did, he laid it out. Why aren't you letting me back into the palace? Go talk to the king. And, and so... The palace. Shortly after he got back in the king, he hired 50 horsemen and a chariot, and every day he would ride out early in the morning and sit at the gate as people came forward to have the king hear their cases and to judge for them. He would judge for them, saying, the king doesn't really care about you. I care about you. King David, he's too busy. He doesn't really care. And over a period of time, the people's hearts were won over, and they believed Absalom, and they began to think he was a better king than David king. And so uh, Absalom overthrew David, and David had to flee into the wilderness. He's an older man at this point. It was a very difficult time. You can read more about it in Second uh, Samuel. It begins in chapter 13, but it goes on into 19, uh, and uh, how it all ends. This psalm is written in the midst of David's flight. And uh, part of what happened is it's not only the tragedy of Absalom's, uh, Absalom's uh, betrayal, but it's also the fact that so many people that David thought trusted him and believed him and valued him came out against him. In fact, there were people who lined the street and mocked and ridiculed David as he fled for his life from Jerusalem. And uh, that must have been a for David in, uh, in that time. But sometimes in this whole story, in Psalm is that these events that David was really a tragedy of David's doing. It was a tragedy that came about because of Yes, Absalom is responsible for the, the sins he committed, for sure, but he had the ability to commit those sins. He had the freedom to commit those sins because David himself failed to uphold the law. David failed to protect his daughter from Amon. And then when Amon committed the sexual offense, David failed to punish him for that crime. 
And when Absalom killed his brother, David failed that crime of Absalom as well. And when Absalom abused his power and got the field on fire, David failed to act. And even though David heard there were grumblings and there was potential that Absalom was doing something, he failed to act. So the problem that David is experiencing and the tragedy that causes him to write this psalm is a tragedy of his own doing. It's something that he created by his failure to be obedient. And I think that's important for us to know because too often we're ready to accept God's forgiveness for the sins that we commit, which are, are you know, the, the, the sins we commit and we don't really think about them. And then, then we struggle with asking God for help when we've created our own problems. We struggle to ask God to deliver us when we're struggling and we're having adversities because we made stupid choices. We too often say, I'm just getting what I deserve. We settle for that, like I'm going to punish myself because I did something wrong and now I've got to pay the price for it. And I think it's helpful for us to listen as David approaches the Lord and to learn also from how we can be bold in approaching the Lord even when we are going through hard times as a result of our own choices, our own uh, decisions. So we go on, verse 2. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. So just to go back and pick it back up with one. O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Imagine David is looking at all the people that are lining the streets, mocking him, uh, sneering at him, uh, throwing things at him as he, he flees. And then he says, many are saying of my soul... There is no salvation for him in our God. There is no salvation for David. This is what people are saying. He's beyond hope. Even God save him. There is deem himself. Of what are you afraid? What's your greatest I was thinking about that because this passage taps on a fear that we have as Christians. People. That's what you do when you have a question that needs to get answered. It's true online, so we know that. So I went online and I, I Googled that. Okay, what? I wonder if I have to pay Google now for that. Well, anyway, what are the fears? And uh, it's interesting, there was a study conducted in 2019 of what are the most searched in America. And we're not going to go through all, they do it by state. We're not going to go through interesting, uh, some of the, uh, f the phobias that took place. For example, fear of people and fear of spiders are the top two phobias, fears, in 11 states. North Dakota and Wyoming have no consistent only two states without a consistent phobia. They're just afraid of a variety of things. New Mexico one of the sunniest states in the U.S., and yet they are the most Anna has uh, some heights, great heights to it. Tallest peaks include Granite Peak of 12,808 feet and Mount Wood at 12,661 feet, and yet that state is... California, which is home to Silicon Valley, and... Success. New York, which has the least licensed driver per capita of any state in the Union, has the greatest fear of driving. And what is Michiganers? What are we most afraid of? Bugs. We we most of the term is bugs. But really, what are you afraid of? It may be the loss of, uh, of your wealth or your health or the loss of a loved one. Um, but I think that a great fear that we have as Christians is the fear that God's love will not abide with us that we, we have lost the privilege to receive God's grace. That's what David is expressing in this verse, verse 2. People are saying to you, David, they're saying, David, even God is not listening to you. 
David, you, your sin is so great that even the Father cares nothing about you. That's a fear that taps into us as well. We intellectually know this cannot be true. We know that there is no sin greater than our Lord Jesus Christ. There is no sin that can separate us from our Father. We know this. We know, for example, 2 Peter chapter 3, 9, where it's, Peter says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, wishing that all, that none should perish, but all should be saved. Or Ephesians 2.17. And Jesus Christ, those who are far off and those who are near. There's nobody far, too far for the Father's love. There's no sin too great for the Father's mercy. We know these in our head, but in our heart. So when we hear the words of absolution spoken by the pastor, we begin to question. When we receive Christ's body and blood in the, the sacrament of the altar, we wonder, is this grace really for me? We only think of our... And I wonder if that's what happened with David and his children. David failed... ...for his sin because David himself committed a sexual crime. David failed to deal with his son Absalom because David himself murdered him. And perhaps in his own guilt and his own shame, he failed to discipline his children. And the problems cascaded because he didn't listen to Nathan, the prophet, who said, your sins are forgiven. And he wrestled with that. And if you are wrestling with God's grace and mercy, you were wrestling and saying, if you just knew what was inside and what I'm, the, the kinds of things that I am thinking and the kinds of things I have done, you wouldn't be saying God's grace is for me. I want you to know God's grace is for you. And that your sins are forgiven. The blood of the Lamb cleanses you from all unrighteousness. Romans 8, 1 says, There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You are holy and righteous before your Father. The psalmist continues, <clears throat> But you, O Lord, you are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. Notice that David doesn't choose to listen to people. He listens instead to the Lord, and he says, Lord, you are my shield. You are my mattress. There is nothing that anyone can do to me because of God who is in me. And that we have these same gifts, these same graces. If, if it's your Bible, write Romans 8. Because in Romans 8, verses 31 and following, Paul says, What then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? In all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither height, nor death, nor life, nor angels, nor nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor that anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. David said, the Lord is my shield. So the, imagine walking down this dirty road. David and a few servants, they're taking a hasty retreat out of Jerusalem. And there are people who have lined the streets and they're laughing at him and they're mocking him once proud king is now brought low and he is struggling of people criticizing me is not as tall as the wall of God surrounding me the shield of the Lord and the Lord is our shield and comforter as well when people say that we're not good enough when people say the worth when people say that that we are failures and that we are are, are insignificant Remember who you are in Jesus Christ. That in baptism, God has chosen you to be His child, His prince and princess in His kingdom. And let that be the shield that surrounds your identity in Christ. And let that be your comfort and your peace. Notice verse 5 and 6. I lay down and sleep. I woke again. The Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. 
you've probably had the same experience I have. When we're struggling, when we're going through some adverse time, it's hard to sleep, right? You lay down and you just want to get some rest. You're so tired, but your thoughts are racing. You're trying to solve the problem. You're trying to come up with reasons why people are wrong. You're trying to, to deal with the anxiety and the, the, the grief inside you the best you can, and sleep will not come. Even though through this torturous time, his family is being torn apart, his kingdom is being torn from him, David said, I, lied, I, I laid myself down and I slept. And it was a good sleep. I woke up refreshed. Why? Because David slept in the arms of the Lord. When David laid himself down, I don't know if they had the prayer back then, down to sleep. It's true. As he laid himself down to sleep, the Lord kept him safe. He was in the arms of the Father. He was in the arms of our Heavenly Father. And so Jesus tells us in Matthew 6, don't worry. Don't worry about what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat. Don't worry about these things. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. We can rest and be refreshed in our Lord Jesus Christ. Because all the answers and all the victory is found in Him, and not in our worry. Jesus said you can't add a single day to your life by worry, so why do you do it? David celebrates the fact he rests in the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. He continues in verse 7, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. <clears throat> Notice how David goes from being one who pleads to one who demands, if you will, who commands. There are two commands here. Two commands that, that uh, David gives him, gives to the Lord. Save me, O God. Rise up and strike. David is bold to ask exactly what he needs. He doesn't come before the Lord and say, you know, Lord, I'm a poor, miserable sinner, and, and, I, and I'm guilty, and, and you know, if I possibly do this, would you consider maybe helping me out a little bit, Lord? David knows through faith he stands righteous before the Father and therefore he commands the Lord, Save me. Rise up, O Lord. Respond to this issue, this problem. And Jesus said, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be given, will be opened to you. How many times are we too hesitant to simply ask the Lord for what? David says of the Lord that he is ready to deliver. Be bold and ask for what it is that you need. Salvation belongs to the Lord. He ends this psalm. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be to your people. David is saying, it's you, Lord, not me. You are the victory. You are the salvation. We have that same word of promise and that same hope. So as we leave this psalm, be mindful of us. I want you to be mindful to be bold in your prayer and to be confident in your identity in Jesus Christ, who you are through Christ our Lord, that He has redeemed you with His blood to be His brother or sister, a, a prince and a princess in the kingdom of God, that your heavenly Father has created you and sustained you and is ready to hear your prayer, so be bold. And when you are struggling with doubt, with fear, maybe God doesn't forgive this sin or isn't able to forgive me because I keep sinning in this way. Know that that is the enemy who stands on the road and jeers and mocks and ridicules and that the Lord is the shield around you. And let that shield be your peace so that you might rest in the arms of our Lord. Join me for a word of prayer. Give us boldness. Boldness, the boldness of David. He suffered. He was in anguish and pain because of his sin and his rebellion. And yet he boldly came to your throne of grace and pleaded for his life, for his salvation, for his deliverance. And he concluded with a statement of faith. God is my deliverer. 
Lord Jesus Christ, you are our deliverer. Your death on the cross has paid for our sin and given us freedom. Give us that same bold, boldness of faith when we are in trouble, when we are struggling, that we might find peace and hope and help in your loving arms. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.